versus the kingdom of heaven, Dr. Ruckman used to have a book entitled The Kingdom of God versus the Kingdom of Heaven. And then he rewrote it and called it a sure word of prophecy. I think that's the right book. But uh, when I put this together, I don't remember how much of it came from him and how much of it came from uh, my studies. But we're going to go through it. It's kind of important to know this, that there's a difference. You know, we've got the, the presidential primaries taking place right now. And they're all trying to convince the voters that who's going to make our country better. Everyone wants to make it better, a better country, a better world, a better quality of life. And the old saying, those who've never learned from history, never learn from history, and that, that's uh, what we're seeing now. But all my life I've heard politicians talking about bringing peace on earth. Uh, probably all of you can remember since you were children how uh, this administration was going to bring peace to the Middle East. Heard that? Has there ever been peace? My, my, my. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and their formula, the politicians, their formula for peace is always the inherent goodness of man. Well, man, we're, man is basically good. And we're going to all get together in unity. And we're going to bring peace to the, this earth. And it'll be peace in their minds, without God, without the Bible, and without Jesus Christ. And folks, it ain't going to happen. It just is not going to happen. The kingdom and the peace that men seek to bring about is not going to happen without the Prince of Peace. Only when the Lord returns and puts down that, that old slew foot, old smutty face, the devil is bound for a thousand years and the Lord will bring peace to this earth but history has already proven that men are incapable of bringing peace uh, prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 6 14 peace peace and there is no peace James 4 1 uh, James wrote from whence come wars and fightings among you come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members it all comes from the hearts of men uh, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. So we don't ask God because we think and man's philosophy has been to look to ourselves. We can figure this out ourselves. We don't need God. In fact, there's uh, movements with the current Congress uh, here and there to remove God from this and remove God from that. Supreme Court just ruled this week that they're not going to let them remove in God we trust from our currency. Uh, that's a new one. Uh, but there's always going to be wars until the Lord comes back. There's, there's an old Prussian saying, and, and it goes like this, that's in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. And, and that's about it. The history of the world has been nothing but wars, and fighting, and men trying to build kingdoms, and to take the kingdom that they've built and overthrow another kingdom. It's all about conquering and to conquer. And one of the main themes in the Bible, one of the main themes is authority and about kings and kingdoms. You've got six books about kings and kingdoms. You've got First and Second Kings, you've got First and Second Samuel, you've got First and Second Chronicles, and they're all about kings and kingdoms. It's always who's going to be in charge. We see it in our uh, Christian circles. One group wants to be in charge of all the other groups. Man, it, uh, mankind is a, a, a mess. Uh, kings and kingdoms, authority and power. Yeah, it's, it's who's going to be in charge, like the fellow that called in, called the police. Well, the bank's getting robbed. Send somebody down here right away. The, guy, uh, the dispatcher said, well, who's in charge there? He said, the guy with the gun. And, and that's kind of how it is. Uh, somebody want, always wants to be in charge. In charge. Men have tried. All the past efforts of men to bring about world peace has just been a miserable failure 
and always will be until the Lord returns. A minute they've tried education, they've tried science, they've tried philosophy, psychology, religion, and every ism known to mankind to bring about world peace, and they haven't done it. Every kingdom builder has one common thread in their thesis. Everyone trying to build a kingdom, and that common thread is that they will be in charge. China, they want to be in charge. Russia, Putin wants to be in charge. America, Trump says, we need to be in charge. Everyone wants to be in charge. Now, America's for world peace as long as, as they are in, chi- in charge. That's the same with China, same with Russia, kings and kingdoms. That's the theme, always has been since the Lord ascended up to heaven. Man in his infinite wisdom has decided to exclude God from the kingdom and run things himself. All right. Jeremiah 10, 23 said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And, and we want to be in charge and want to tell God to get out of the way. You know what happens to a lot of churches? Why churches go out of business, so to speak? Because a pastor says, runs God off, said, God, you get out of the way. I mean, I, all this training I've had, all those letters behind my name, man, I'm going to do a work here like they've never seen before. God, get out of my way. It, hey, hey, it goes along with, with, with about everything you can think of. Uh, 700 years before Christ was born, the prophet Isaiah showed up and told about this king. He said, for unto us, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a king, is, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of of peace. So we see in time past that God separated Israel to himself and he told them about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now over in Luke chapter 2 the Bible says that the angels appeared to the shepherds in the field and the angel said unto them in Luke 2 10 fear not for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. Notice they said that this king is going to be to all people. Uh, Not just the Jews, not to just a few elect. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Not only a king, but a Savior. To save the people from their sins. Now the Jews didn't see that. And this shall be a sign unto you, it says in verse 12... Uh, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now notice that word toward. It don't say goodwill to men. It says it's toward us. It's in our direction. God's goodwill through Jesus Christ is available to us. It's in our direction. It don't automatically come to us, but it's there for us if we'll grasp it and appropriate it. God's goodwill toward man. But God commendeth his love toward us. Available to us. It's in our direction. He told the Jews, the word was nigh thee, even at thy mouth. They they could have accepted their king, their Messiah, if they'd wanted to. The problem is they men don't want to. It's toward them. It's right there. It's right there for all to grasp. They just don't want it. That means that God's favor was available to man. It was toward man in his direction. God's goodwill toward man was for peace through Jesus Christ. The Lord would later say in John 16, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. How do you find peace today? You find it in Jesus Christ. 
So from the time of the early prophets down through the ages, the Jews were looking for this king and a kingdom to be set up. And as a kingdom that was promised with a king that would rule in righteousness and justice. Isaiah 11 in verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now here in the next uh, verse you'll see the seven spirits of God that are mentioned in Revelation. Those candlesticks in the bottom, they had the seven. These are the seven spirits of God. Here they are. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's one. And the spirit of wisdom, that's two. The spirit of understanding, that's three. The spirit of counsel, four. Spirit of might, that's five. Spirit of knowledge, six. And the fear of the Lord. That's the seven spirits of God that you'll read about in the book of Revelation. And shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now, the next uh, uh, several verses talks about the animals during this millennial reign of Christ. If you haven't picked up on that already, now we'll see that the animals lose their predatory nature. And the same they were, uh, that they were prior to the flood. If you remember prior to the flood in Genesis 1, I think it's Genesis 1, 30, somewhere in there. No, it's not. But the Lord said to the, I will give the green herb. For every beast of the field for meat. And that's just a quick sidebar. The animals were vegetarian and they did not have a predatory nature. So guess what happens during the millennial reign? It says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. They're not predatory. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Do you know the implications for that Bible truth when it comes to the ark? You know what all those animals ate? The wild animals as well as the tame They all ate hay. Provender. Kind of makes things a little simpler, don't it? It says, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, here's the king, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be Glorious. My, my, my. That's prophet Isaiah. That is one of the Jewish, Jewish folks, great prophets. And this kingdom here that I talked about is the one that the Jews were looking for when Christ showed up on earth. God, uh, he, this was a literal, visible, physical kingdom that God had promised to the Jews right here on earth. God had even given the boundaries of this land grant to the children of Israel. No matter what the UN has to say about it, God gave uh, the children of Israel that land grant, uh, set out the borders for each tribe and so forth. And the children of Israel, they were looking for a king to sit on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem and rule in peace and righteousness. But when the Lord shows up, the Jews... The, uh, to the Jews, the Lord did not fit the profile. The Jews were looking for a military leader to take them out from under the Roman bondage and then set up the kingdom. They wanted a Saul. They wanted somebody tall and good looking. Yeah. 
somebody like Brother Rob. You know, they wanted somebody, you know, just. I didn't hear a peep. He didn't. Nobody heard what I said. I guess. Anyway. <clears throat> and those days came. Then John the Baptist shows up. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So then Jesus himself shows up, and in Matthew 4 says, uh, From that time uh, began, Jesus, the Bible says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You notice it's all here, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. Uh, John the Baptist and the Lord here are preaching a literal, visible, physical kingdom. To the nation of Israel. Matthew 10 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them. Saying go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not. That leaves me and you out. Now listen. But go rather. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's, Jesus Christ in the Gospels is preaching the kingdom of heaven, a literal, visible, physical kingdom to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Preaching to the Jews. The Lord's ministry was a Jewish ministry until they rejected him. Matthew 15, uh, 24, remember the, uh, the woman that came to the Lord and the disciples said to get her away from here. She's not a Jew. Run her off. And, she, and, and finally the Lord told her, said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Or is this starting to make sense to you? In fact, as the Lord preached this gospel of the kingdom to the Jews... He went on to delineate the rules of this millennial kingdom. And some refer to it as the, con the constitution of this kingdom with the Sermon on the Mount. Constitution for the millennial reign of Christ. I'm getting kind of theological tonight. But sometimes you need a little meat to go with the milk. Matthew 5, 3, the Lord said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, and notice that kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you. So then the Jews, as well as the disciples here, are preaching the kingdom of heaven with Jesus Christ to sit on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. And if, if the Jews had not rejected their Messiah and King, if they would have received Christ then it appeared that this kingdom would have come about. Would have come about then. But at the rejection of Jesus Christ, at the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, this kingdom was postponed. And a little parenthetical thing called the church, which was hid in times past. The mystery church came about because God had already made provision for the church. And what was hidden to the Jew, even hidden to the disciples, was the mystery of the church. Brother Phil Gabbard has been teaching on the mysteries. And this is one of them. Ephesians 5.32 This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
When John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says in Mark 1.14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What's that? We see the kingdom of heaven, which is a visible, literal, physical kingdom that the Lord is going to set up here on earth. But they thought it was going to happen then. If they'd received their Messiah, it would have. But here's another kingdom being preached, which is referred to as the kingdom of God. So then if the kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, visible kingdom here on earth, then the obvious question, you know, it begs the question, is the kingdom of God the same as the kingdom of heaven? Let's see what the Bible says about it. Luke 17. Luke 17 and verse 20. Luke 17 and verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Can't see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven was literal, physical, visible. Can't see the kingdom of God. He said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for watch it, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Where did that come from? Jews never heard anything like that before. Disciples had never heard anything like that before. What's that about? Then Paul said in Romans 14, 17. Paul said in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. And here he defines what it is. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Wow. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So then if the kingdom of heaven is a literal, visible, physical kingdom here on earth, then it appeared that the kingdom of God is not physical, but spiritual. Am I starting to make sense? A spiritual kingdom, and that's the kingdom that the Jews was not expecting and did not see coming. If the Jews would have accepted their Messiah, they would have had both. The literal, visible, physical kingdom plus the Spirit of God in them or on them. They could have had both. My, my, my. Ezekiel 37, 14, and shall put my spirit in you. That's talking about the Jew and the millennial reign of Christ. And you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. That's what he went to do the first time if they would have accepted him. When I, when I got saved, when you got saved, we became part of a spiritual body and that spiritual body of Christ is manifested visibly physically literally in the local church no you're not we are bone of his bone flesh of his flesh members in particular we are his body the church and it's manifested Physically and visibly in the local church. And a lot of folks have a falling out with this. It's, they, they take it to extreme one way or another. They can't see both issues there. So it appears the kingdom of God is not a physical but a spiritual kingdom. The one the Jews didn't see. And when I, when I and you and whoever will get saved, they become part of that body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And I don't know what else you can do with this verse. 
but it says, for by one spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. John 4, 24, the Bible says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so you've got the kingdom of heaven, literal, physical, visible. The Lord's going to set up his throne uh, on, the, on the seat of David, the throne of David, in the city of Jerusalem at the second advent. Wow, what a thing. The millennium gets ushered in. Kingdom of heaven is literal. Would have been then. Would have come in then if the Jews would have received it. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It don't come with observation. It's not meat and drink. But joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. We are part of a spiritual body. A spiritual organism manifested by a visible, physical body, the local church. Failure to separate these two kingdoms caused a lot of confusion in the church. Uh, when Adam was created, he was created in the image of God. Okay, the, He had a spiritual crown. He had the image of God, right? Uh, plus, he was given dominion over God's creation. He had the kingdom. He had a, the a, physical, literal crown over creation. God gave the earth to him. Told him to replenish and multiply. Subdue the earth. The environmentalist will tell you to preserve the earth. And God told Adam to subdue the environment. You make it livable and workable. That being said, I'm sure God expected man to be good stewards of his creation. Just thought I'd throw that in, getting kind of quiet. The spiritual was lost when Adam fell. He lost that spiritual image of God. He lost that spirit, that kingdom of God was lost in Adam the moment he sinned. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth... Him will I blot out of the book of the living. What God told Moses. And it was restored. That image was restored in Jesus Christ. What they called Jesus? They called him the second Adam. Or the last Adam. I forget how that was worded. The spiritual was lost at Adam's fall. And it was restored in Jesus Christ to all who received him. The missing link, of course, was the spirit of God. From Adam till the time Jesus Christ showed up, there's no spirit of God. In dwelling man, there's no spirit of, spirit of God in man. He lost that. That's why the Lord told Nicodemus, she must be born again. Renewed in the image of God. All right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Heaven was created. God was not created. He always was. Birds fly in heaven. They don't fly in God. Get it? There are clouds in heaven. There's no clouds in God. The heavens are material. You can see them. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. Uh, the heavens contain darkness, but in God there is no darkness at all. The heavens can be populated. God cannot be populated. Failure to, see, failure to separate the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of God has led to a lot of misinterpretations of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom that the Lord was preaching to the Jews. Run off the, the, the non-Jewish woman that came up. Said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But after the, the, after, she, after the Jews rejected the Lord, then he opened it up and said, Repentance had, come to the, had been granted 
to the Gentile. That's where we come in. After the Jews rejected their Messiah. Wow. Now, one of the positions, there's, we consider ourselves as Bible believers, most of us consider ourselves premillennial. That means that Christ is going to set up, come, the second advent of Christ is in the second advent. Don't mix that up with the rapture. The rapture is God. We meet God in the air in the clouds. He don't come all the way to the earth during the rapture. We're caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The second advent is talking about when the Lord comes back following the seven-year tribulation. Church has been gone for seven years. The Lord comes back. That's the second advent. That's when he sets up his millennial reign in Jerusalem on the throne of David. Now, one of the positions where they get this messed up is a thing called post-millennialism. And they believe that this world will just get better and better. And, you know, all the evidence out there will tell you just the opposite. But they think it will get better and better of the entire world becoming Christianized. And after this happens, Christ will return. However, this is not the view of the world and the end times that the Scripture declares. The Bible says men shall wax worse and worse. Hmm. Another position is called amillennialism. We're premillennial. We believe the Lord comes back before the millennium. Uh, the postmillennium says he comes back after that. The amillennialist is the name given to the belief that there will not be a thousand year reign of Christ. And the people who hold to this belief are called amillennialists. The prefix A as in amillennialism means no or not, no millennium. Hence, uh, amillennialism means no millennium. Remember all the verses about the thousand years? The devil will be bound for a thousand years. The Lord shall rule for a thousand years. So people miss, miss those things. My position, the staff's position, is premillennial. The Lord's going to come back before the millennial reign and rapture out the church. Catch out the bride of Christ. We're going to be gone. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. My, that's a mystery too. Behold, I show you a mystery. The Lord shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air, ever to be with the Lord. Here. Wow. Isn't that wild? So just a Bible lesson tonight, you'll come across those two things. Sometimes John the, the Baptist would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they were both at hand if the Jews would have accepted their Messiah. It's an, it's, that, that book is about the most interesting book you ever get your hands on. But the little subtle things in that book make a big difference. We just try to believe it as it states, as it says. Not try to make anything more or anything less out of what the scripture says. Hey, I'm done. Everyone stand up tonight. If you've got the spirit of God in you, you're part of that spiritual kingdom. And you identify yourself with a visible, physical, literal, local church. Isn't that wild? You know, God is a spirit, but he identified with mankind. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Folks should behold Christ in you, the hope of glory. By your testimony, by the way you act, by the way you walk and talk. You're here tonight, the altar's open. If you've never become part of this spiritual kingdom, you do that by trusting Jesus Christ. That's the simplicity of Christ. You know you're a sinner. 
you believe Christ is a Savior, you just call on him and ask him to be merciful to you, a sinner. That don't sound too tough, does it? My, my, my. The altar's open as we sing.